Well, hey guys, happy December 1st, only one more month of 2021 and then we will boom, be in another year and before you know it, it will be 2027 or something like that. Time just flies too quickly. All right, today's video as I yammer on is all of my favorites and some fails from the month of November. I know you guys really enjoy these videos. I do each month of what I've been using over the month, liking, hating, etc. I also incorporate some lifestyle things like books, movies. So if you enjoy these, um, I will link my playlist that you can watch prior months. Uh, so make sure you check that out. All right, the first one is a fail for me. I've been using it actually longer than a month but I've come to the final conclusion here that I would definitely not recommend this. I mean, I kind of knew I wouldn't recommend it, but I do like to try things out regardless. First of all, this is a face wash with tea tree oil in it. I've always cautioned against tea tree oil. It's easy to become allergic to it. It's not a pure substance, but there are studies that do show benefits for a variety of skin issues with tea tree oil, acne, certain fungal infections. So but y'all have been asking me to review some of their tea tree oil products. So I decided to give this a try. And I don't know if it was the tea tree oil or spoiler alert, another fragrance in the ingredient in this is menthol. But my goodness, I could not tolerate this around my eyes at all. Oh my goodness. I don't know how people tolerate this as a face wash. It also caused a lot of tingling on my face, just the menthol sensation. I'm not really used to washing my face with things that have menthol. Um, so I tried using this also as an armpit wash when I decided I didn't want to use it on my face anymore, and that's been fine. Kind of using it, you know, tea tree oil may help in deodorizing the skin, but I don't know. Once I'm finished with it, that'll be the end of that. Comment below though, I know a lot of you guys use, um, I want to call it Bath and Body Works. I know a lot of, many of you guys use the Body Shop. What other products do you guys like from the Body Shop? Let me know so I can try them out. Um, I used to use their body butters a long time ago. The mango one was a favorite. Obviously it has fragrance and I now try and avoid fragrance in leave-on products like moisturizers, but I always enjoyed those. So I wish they would come out with like a fragrance-free one. Those were always good. All right, so that was a fail for me. And then this is both a win and a definite fail at the same time. And I had such high hopes for this, but I kind of knew, I kind of knew this was gonna happen. So Neutrogena came out with a fragrance-free Hydro Boost sunscreen. Now, if you guys have been following my videos for any number of years now, you know, a few years ago, they came out with a Hydro Boost sunscreen that I reviewed and hated because it put that god awful fragrance in it. But otherwise, the texture, the formulation, it was very nice overall, if I recall correctly. It's been a while since I have dabbled in that product and a lot of people love it. So I was elated to see they came out with an SPF 50 fragrance-free hyaluronic acid moisturizer. Um, and I gotta say, it looks great on the skin. At first it goes on actually a little bit shiny. It comes out, it comes out opaque white. but it's a chemical sunscreen, so there's no cast. It's a hydrogel vehicle. So what that means is that it's fast absorbing, quick dry, non-greasy. This would be a great sunscreen for people who live in a humid climate, who have very oily skin, and it's fantastic for hair bearing areas like the beard area, the mustache, the brows, and there's no cast. It has hyaluronic acid, which can help in imparting improved hydration to the skin. It does have alcohol denaturant in it, which in this product, you know, that's, that's a helpful ingredient for allowing for that fast dry, quick dry formulation for helping with the evaporation of sweat. I know a lot of you guys find that sunscreens make you feel overheated. This would be a good one for that particular concern. However, however, and I knew this was going to happen and I honestly don't fault Neutrogena because they really don't have you know, much wiggle room. Burny eyes to the nines. This will seep into your eyes because it's not water resistant, so it's even more of an issue. You know, as the day goes on, inevitably some of it's going to end up seeping into your eyes, blinding, blinding. I could not tolerate this as a facial sunscreen. I even tried using it on my face and sparing the eye area and putting like a plain zinc oxide sunscreen around my eyes, still managed to get into my eyes. So could not tolerate it at all on the face. I mean, it 
just from that Bernie eyes perspective. Love the way it looks, um, not greasy. It lo looks a little shiny at first, but as time goes on, it kind of, I mean, it's almost, it's, it's invisible. And Neutrogena does a really good job with their chemical sunscreens as far as formulating them to have good stabilization of Ava Benzone. That is the UVA filter that we have here. We don't have many other ingredients, which is why I don't fault Neutrogena on the Bernie eyes thing, because when it comes to chemical sunscreens, in the US, we really only have so many ingredients that we can use and that just ends up with products that end up frequently burning and stinging either the eyelid skin or getting into the eyes and causing that burning eye. So it didn't burn and sting actually for me around the eyes or to the skin or anything like that. But man, it certainly does cause those burny eyes to the nines. The formulation, the consistency, the way it dries down, it's very similar as far as just the look, the feel, and the consistency to like Japanese sunscreens or uh, European sunscreens that are, have a more lightweight feel to them. But if they had those same filters, I swear this would not burn a sting around the eye. Now this is a product that is new to me and is newly released, I actually, I believe, re-released. And it's a cleansing balm by a Korean brand, Beauty of Joseon. Anyways, this was sent to me from YesStyle as a PR gift. And initially I was a little confused because some websites said it had fragrance. And then I realized it has been reformulated and it no longer has some of the essential oils that it no longer has essential oils like the older formula. I love it, long story short. I've used quite a bit of it. It comes with a little scoop. I'm actually almost finished with it. I don't know if you can tell. Um, this, to me, if you like the Clinique Take the Day Off Cleansing Balm, you should try this. Uh, you probably would like it. It has sea buckthorn oil and oat extract. I think it has rice extract as well. Glides onto the skin very well doesn't, uh, it emulsifies easily with just, you know, water and gentle cleanser. It does a very good job at removing the cosmetic residue. I would say the consistency of this is very similar to the new Polish Choice Omega Cleansing Balm that I also really love, but is, uh, you know, kind of pricey. Now, the Inky List Oak Cleansing Balm is another favorite of mine. A lot of people don't like that because it kind of has an odd odor. I did not find this to have an odd odor whatsoever. And unlike that, this is in a uh, little tub pot jar. So you don't kind of get any separation. It stays solid at uh, room temperature. You don't get any liquefaction. You know, the Inky List one, a lot of people complain that when they first squeeze it out, some of the oily components separates out from the product. And I agree that that can be a bit of a nuisance. Vegan and cruelty free. So that is it for skincare, lifestyle. All right, you guys know I am a coffee-aholic and Four Sigmatic, this is not sponsored, but Four Sigmatic came out with some new coffees. Their Perform Coffee, I love. It's sold out, <laughs> of course, but it has very nice chocolatey undertones, delicious. I think it actually has a little bit more caffeine in it. So if you, you know, find that drinking too much coffee makes you jittery, I would steer away from the Perform one because you may get to that jittery state a little bit prematurely. But I didn't really, you know, have any issue with it. And they also came out with one that is called their Immune Support Coffee that likewise is delicious. I've also been enjoying their new decaf. If you like decaf coffee, try this one out because I find that a lot of really good coffee brands, when they do a decaf, it just, it just loses all flavor to me. And instead, whenever I want decaf, I find that the instant decaf coffees are a little bit more consistent and perform a little bit better as far as flavor. But this, it's definitely not as flavorful as their regular coffees, but it doesn't lose all flavor. It's still got a good bite to it and is overall very good. And I've been enjoying that as well when I, you know, have to back off from the caffeine. Speaking of backing off on caffeine, you guys know I also love drinking tea. I have been drinking a lot of ginger tea from Peak Tea lately. Their ginger digestion elixir is awesome, but this is something that I highly recommend if you like to sweeten your tea with a sugar alternative. These pumpkin spice monk fruit drops. I got these on iHerb. They are delicious. I mean, I don't know why you would need to buy anything pumpkin spice if you like that flavor profile, so long as you have these because you can make anything pumpkin spice with this. Tastes delicious in the ginger tea. Oh my gosh, I am hooked on that. And this, it's not super, super sweet, but it does impart sweetness. I mean, it's monk fruit. Monk fruit, I find, 
is slightly less sweet than just plain sugar. And so if you're trying to get away from overly sweetened things, but you want some sweet, I do think monk fruit is a good option. I have had Starbucks pumpkin spice things in the past, and it's gotten to the point with those that I just feel like there's really no credibility there as far as anything resembling pumpkin pie or the spices that go in pumpkin pie. It is its own separate entity, and I don't classify it as any pumpkin-y spice type thing. But this actually has more authentic undertones of like nutmeg, ginger to it. So I would, I would suggest this. I've really been loving specifically making ginger tea lattes with this. I use my little milk frother, put some almond milk, dissolve the peak tea, ginger digestion elixir crystals in the milk frother and add this. Oh, so good. I watched a lot of movies this month. Got my Amazon Prime's worth. I've been watching mostly movies on there. Some of you have asked me if I've seen new movies that are out in the theaters. No, I don't. It's difficult for me to get to the movie theaters because a lot of them around me that I really have liked have gone out of business actually, or one of them I don't go to anymore because I got so frustrated going there. Every time I went, there was always some technical problem and I would have to go to the front and get my money back. So I stopped going there and I just haven't been going to the movies in person like at all. So I would rather watch them at home. So what have I been watching? Okay, I rewatched Legends of the Fall because if you've not seen that movie, Montana Scenery and Brad Pitt, what else do I need to say here? Nothing else, it is good. It's a, actually, it's a touch corny in the sense, uh, it's a romantic movie and it's you know a little bit cheesy. But Brad Pitt is so good in this movie that it just doesn't matter. And the scenery is beautiful. And actually overall the cast is amazing. Anthony Hopkins does a particularly good job as the father figure. Yeah, if you've never watched Legends of the Fall, I highly recommend it. In fact, I would binge watch Legends of the Fall with A River Runs Through It, another Montana Brad Pitt combination that is winning, yeah. Love those movies. So I rewatched Legends of the Fall. It is a favorite, although again, I admit it is a little on the corny side, but overall it's a beautiful movie and it's a fun watch. Also watched a movie on Amazon Prime that I enjoyed, Uncle Frank with Paul Bettany. Rather enjoyed that, had again, a good cast. It was about a uh, man who is gay in the 70s and he has to return home. His father has died and his family doesn't know that he's gay. His father had rejected him because of being gay. And so it's a very good story seeing that kind of family dynamic. I love family dramas, family dynamic. I watched a movie called Patterson with Adam Driver. He has been in a lot of movies in the past couple of years. Has anyone else noticed that? Like. He is in a ton of movies on Amazon Prime. When I had Netflix, he was all over that. I really like him a lot. And I think he always seems to do a good job. Even if the movie isn't particularly good, he always you know, does a great job. But I enjoyed this movie and I love the fact that it kind of centers around the routine. If you guys notice in my vlogs, I always do go to the same places, do the same thing. I thrive on kind of a regimented routine. And the main character who is a poet in this uh, movie also is very much the same way. And of course the day to day, there's differences and you know updates and things change as far as the things that you see and talk about, but the routine is the same. And that is how this guy is. He's very much like me. <laughs> and that, you know, his routine is centered around going to work. He's a bus driver and writing in his, writing his poems, going to the same bar every night, walking the dog at the same time. And I, I really enjoyed it. So I highly recommend that, especially if you thrive on routines, you will enjoy this movie. <laughs> I finally watched The Eyes of Tammy Faye. Remember I reacted to Jessica Chastain claiming that the makeup like ruined her skin or whatever. Check that video out. <laughs> um, but anyways, I finally watched it and it was pretty good. A little slow moving in the beginning, but overall a good job. I wouldn't, I was a little let down. I would give it, I would give it like a 3.8 out of five. I think the actors did a really good job, but the writing was not that strong. And some of the dialogue was a little slow moving and a little surface level. Otherwise, I think Jessica Chastain did an amazing job as did the other actors in the movie. So definitely check it out, but I paid, I rented it. It was like 3.99 on Amazon, which isn't too bad. Much better than going to the movie theater and paying like whatever movie theater prices are. 
So that would be one to check out. Maybe it was $5.99. I don't know. Amazon has gotten kind of pricey with their renting. All right, and last but not least, it's not a movie, but it's free to watch on YouTube, and that is reruns of Garfield and Friends. I watched the Garfield and Friends Thanksgiving episode and the Christmas episode. And I always loved that cartoon when it was on TV back in the day. And I still love it. I think it's funny. Yeah, the Garfield and Friends episode, holiday episodes, the Thanksgiving one and the Christmas one, definitely check them out if you're like wanting some festive holiday show on in the background. If you're just kind of sick of a lot of the Christmas holiday classic movies, but you want something on in the background that is holiday themed, definitely play the Garfield and Friends holiday episodes. I think they also have the um, Smurfs holiday episode and some of the other like popular cartoons from the 80s that, uh, that had all holiday episodes. So check those out on YouTube. I'm so glad to find them for free because I love those. I hope they don't ever take those away off of YouTube. <laughs> all right, books. I uh, did quite a bit of reading. I finished the book that I talked about in the last favorites video. I Captured the Castle by Dodie Smith, the author who wrote 101 Dalmatians. I love that book. I need to now see the movie that was made by the BBC of it. It's a really funny story and it's somehow very relatable despite the fact that it is, you know, an old book. It's that very witty, dry, sarcastic humor that I love. And then I also read this book. This is a nonfiction book, Overdiagnosed. I got it at the library as well. Library, <laughs> library. Making People Sick in the Pursuit of Health by Dr. H. Gilbert Welsh. This was written in 2011, so it's not the most up-to-date, but the problems are definitely very much still germane. Highly encourage reading this book because it really points out a lot of the flaws with early detection and screening uh, in terms of making otherwise healthy people sick. It points out the pitfalls of overdiagnosing by doing screening tests, ordering blood work on otherwise healthy people, and a lot of the reasons why we do these things, mostly out of fear of litigation. It's easy to get sued for missing a diagnosis, but it's unlikely that you would ever be sued for overdiagnosing someone. But overdiagnosing people definitely has a lot of harms. This guy gives several good case examples of over how overdiagnosis leads to patient harms, leads to more testing, more cost on the healthcare system, more medications, which any medication, no matter how safe it is, there's always a risk. And putting people who are otherwise healthy and don't need medications on medications and not good practice of medicine. So it really points out and illustrates many of the problems that arise from basically overdiagnosing. You know, a lot of times I hear people like on YouTube or social media say, you know, ask your doctor for blood work, get blood work, get blood work, get blood work. And talking about it as though there is no harm to getting blood work done. Like what's the harm? You know, like you're getting information, but truthfully there is harm because what are you going to do with that information? Is that information actually telling you that you have a disease. If you're otherwise healthy, pretty much any diagnostic test out there, you could test healthy people and you'll likely find these abnormalities, but it doesn't necessarily equate to disease. Prior to the latter half of the 20th century, people never went to the doctor until they were sick. And now people are encouraged to go and get a lot of screening tests. But some of these screening tests, we actually don't have any evidence that they lead to better outcomes are that they reduce the risk of adverse harms. One example in this book is checking men, uh, checking the PSA, prostate specific antigen in otherwise healthy men, and all of the rabbit holes that you're gonna end up going down with that type of testing, all the flaws. He goes into information on fetal monitoring. And again, this book was written in 2011. Honestly, I don't think that too much in terms of an advancement of any of these testing and the knowledge that we have about the utility of them has changed, but nothing really that he speaks about in this book is in my field, aside from he talks about uh, melanoma screening briefly and skin checks. And that is absolutely true. You know, a lot of times people will say, well, when should we start getting skin checks? When should we start getting skin checks? Truthfully, there's no right answer to that because there is definite harm to just doing skin checks on people who don't have like a family history of melanoma or skin cancer, who don't have, you know, a lot of abnormal moles or anything, it leads to harm because 
A biopsy of certain skin lesions, you know, you've got healing, depending on where it is, it can cause a scar, it can be disfiguring, and it's just incredibly anxiety provoking. And once people hear that there is something abnormal, well, that makes them all the more anxious and all the more, you know, you know, worried that there's something really problematic. A lot of times you'll hear, we're an all time high epidemic of diagnoses of this, but it's not actually an epidemic of disease, it's an epidemic of overdiagnosis because as we get either more tests and start screening people who are otherwise healthy for these things, well, yeah, we're gonna pick up more abnormalities, but are we actually detecting disease? And more often than not, we're not. And it's, it is not without harm because it, again, sends people down this rabbit hole of, well, how do you follow that up? Do you now have to come back to the doctor every, you know, six to nine months to have follow-up? So that was a good one and a really quick read. I mean, you can read this. I read this in like a day, you know, in an afternoon. So you can read that really quickly. I know a lot of you guys though, you don't have much time. You're always like, well, I wish I had more time to read. Try reading short stories. You can read a short story in the few minutes before falling asleep at night. And although I would not necessarily recommend this book for falling asleep at night, because some of the stories I think are a little bit morbid, but I just got this actually yesterday at the library and I've only read one short story so far. I read it last night and I'm gonna recommend at least the short story. I mean, Ray Bradbury, you can't go wrong here. I mean, hello. So I'm not too worried that it's gonna be a flop, but this short story, the first one, The Dwarf, yeah, highly recommend that because if you have ever been bullied, somebody's picking on you, this story really captures the fact that bullies are often just projecting their own problems, insecurities onto you. You know, they say that hurt people hurt people. This story really captures that in just a few pages. So that's the only short story I've read out of there, but I love Ray Bradbury and I'm not concerned that the other stories are not gonna be good. So I feel confident recommending that to you only having read four or five pages out of it. But yeah, that story is definitely a good read. All right, guys, that is everything from the month of November. Um, I hope you all enjoyed this video. And again, check out my other months of favorites. I'll list some of them down below in the description box. But if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends. And as always, don't forget, sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye.